You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Steeter. It is Thursday, April 19th, 2018. My name is Michael Brooks, and I'm Michael Thursday, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Daniel Bessner, Democracy in Exile, a history of the defense intellectuals, German emigres in the 1930s, 40s, the Rand Corporation, and the connection between intellectuals who provide advice on foreign policy and democratic accountability, even as we leave, supposedly, the post-expert age in the Trump era. Republicans move forward their war on the hungry. They're attacking the already very meager and modest food stamp program. A federal judge finds Chris Kobach in contempt of court in a voting rights case. What a surprise. And ICE, your daily report in ICE's terrorism. An upstate New York farmer says ICE officers stormed into his farm without a warrant, cuffed him, and threw his phone. And Trump looking to make a quote-unquote great man play in North Korea, even though If that whole thing works out, we should be thanking South Korea's center-left president. And Castro's rule in Cuba nears an end, as Miguel Diaz-Canal is named sole candidate for leadership change. He's 57 years old, next in line, after Raul. And just how much trouble is... Michael Cohen in. Forget about it? Sorry. It's very lame, but at a certain point, these guys just force you to make the lame New York jokes. It's very offensive to the Italian community. It's very offensive to the Italian community. Um, It's the last group. It's like when Ben Shapiro, he said, you know, Italians like to live in sewage and bomb stuff. Oh, wait, no, that was the Palestinians. Um, This is an amazing ad. There's really no other way to frame this. Um, And it basically seems to be a new... (laughs) We make this point all the time, but for people who make a lot of hay out of, like, sucking it up, you know manning up and just, you know, taking care of business. The most of the conservative, there's the like Donald Trump is hounded by the deep state conspiracy theory people. And there's also basically just the like, you guys are super mean to President Trump. And this ad, where did, where did, where was this ad released? It was on CNBC on Tuesday night during the NHL playoff game. During an NHL playoff game. And this woman's name is Amanda Head. That is correct. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is some new defense. And what, and what is this? Uh, this is a, is it a 501? Uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a sound sheet yet. So I'm, oh, thank you. Where's my sound sheet? Uh, okay, this is... Um, okay, yes, it's a new committee. It's a from the Committee to Defend the President. And check out what they have to defend him from. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Head, conservative talk show host and ardent President Trump supporter. I spent the last election defending Donald Trump daily <laughs> against attacks by liberal Democrats and the mainstream media. But that was nothing compared to the vicious attacks and biased reporting that is taking place today. Disgruntled Democrats are stopping at nothing to undermine (laughs) Donald Trump's presidency. They continue their witch hunt in search of any reason to impeach President Trump. They will stop at absolutely nothing until President Trump is removed from office. 
That is why I am asking every President Trump supporter to pick up the phone now and call the number on your screen. We need to put an end to these attacks and show that we support President Trump all the way through 2020 and that we have his back. Call now. Call 800-369-6163 and press 1 now to deliver your voice in support of President Trump. The committee to defend the president is responsible for the content of this message. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, I can't do that again. Uh, David Roth, writing in Deadspin, says, The spot itself is weird enough on its face. Head, who identifies herself as a quote-unquote Hollywood conservative, is so uncharismatic that she seems deeply and almost poignantly medicated. And even by the prevailing standards of this kind of umbrage-making grifto political garbage, it's hard to tell what the hooker call to action even is. A closer look reveals that it's all the more stranger and even infinitely cheesier than it seems. Um, basically, I mean, it just seems like a uh, a number collection. You know, you're just getting people's data. It's a big net we're casting for the Rube numbers. Yeah, it's just a good... You know, when President Obama was reelected in 2012, video came out of him telling his staff, you know, he... he especially at that time now he's totally in post-presidency and his brand changed a little bit but people kind of forget this and kind of there was a period of time where it was like you know he was spock and very like i don't i don't you know don't i don't get emotional and he was talking after winning the election and thanking his staff and reflecting on his last campaign and he started crying and he was like you know a lot of you you're gonna go on you're gonna accomplish great things and the for-profit sector and the non-profit sector and you're going to contribute and i'm just waiting for the equivalent like trump with his staff being like some of you get a small start small websites that defraud people out of their credit card numbers others of you may may create fake universities <laughs> others of you Maybe you're going to lobby for Central Asian dictatorships. I just, wherever, whatever sector you're working in, some of you might be in prison and you'll write tell-alls. Some of you might even get into the reality TV business. It just, I uh, just want to thank all of you. All right, that was 30 seconds of appreciation for other human beings. That's enough. Folks, are you tired of seeing ads when you want to read the news? Are you sick of social media filters on your news? Do you feel like you're often missing out on breaking news? Download Smart News for free in the App Store or Google Play Store and get your news in real time from over 300 trusted sources, including CNN, Vice, HuffPost, The Hill, and more. Smart News' algorithm automatically curate, curates the must-read stories that matter now so you can get your news in just under a minute. Plus, you can read the news wherever you go, even if you're offline. That's a huge help with this app, being able to catch up on stuff on the subway is an example when you're rushing into work. No wonder Smart News already has more than 25 million users worldwide. Uh, I, this, is, this app's actually helped me a lot because obviously we're in a specific business. We have to read the news all the time. But... One part of it for us, we got to do these really, you know, we have to do deep dives on certain things, kind of like, you know, re like a certain type of research. But I just found I was wasting so much time going through just like a sort of menu of websites to kind of cover all my bases. And now with Smart News app, it's all there for me at my fingertips. I just pop on and I have the baseline of what I need every single day in order to do the show and uh, help organize ourselves, and then it makes all the rest of the process much faster. I recommended it um, to uh, my mom, who's also, you know, she's an avid news consumer, um, but she loves it because she doesn't have to, you know, cruise through a bunch of different websites anymore, and she always gets uh, the fundamentals of the day, fundamentals of it minute by minute if she wants. Smart News, available for free in the Apple Store or Google Play Store. Check it out. Folks, we are going to take a brief musical interlude, and we will be right back with Daniel Bessner. We're talking about democracy in exile. Thank you. 
to reconstruct the air and all that brings. And oxidation is the compromise you own. But this is beginning to feel like the dog wants a bone. Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here. Joining us now is Daniel Bessner. He is an assistant professor in American foreign policy at the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. And he's author of Democracy in Exile, Hans Speer, and the Rise of the Defense Intellectual. Daniel, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks very much for having me. So, this is a this is a story that takes us through obviously this guy Hans Speer who you're going to explain to us in a minute he's the he's the sort of pre Henry Kissinger in some respects um, of the kind of European exile who sort of set actually really set the model um, for this uh, influence in American foreign policy but we could think of the sort of brand names Henry Kissinger Zeb Brzezinski there's an interesting history here and. Let's just start to work it backwards a little bit. We go to Trump, and you know certainly the perspective, of, uh, my perspective, and the perspective of this show is one of a much more structural critique of U.S. foreign policy that transcends, uh, you know, partisanship and has a lot of bad things to say, and maybe just analytic things to say about both Republican and Democratic administrations. Now that said, you know the Trump administration has earned the brand and rightfully so in a lot of ways of basically being um, uh, messy, melodramatic idiots who despise, you know, expertise. And, uh, you know, in the Bush era, we had all of these, uh, all, and this is all my editorial, fanatics who pushed for things like invading <laughs> Iraq and a global, you know, war on terror and implemented torture regimes and all the rest of it. Uh, but, you know, uh, they they did have this sort of appropriate uh uh, training according to the standards of the establishment. And now we have, you know, uh, this is the Gorka administration. But that being said, if we pull the lens out a little bit wider and look at John Bolton, we can actually trace that all the way back to the rise of the defense intellectual and Hans Spear and the story you're telling. So maybe situate this a little bit and then we'll dig into the history of Hans Spear and Rand Corporation. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think it's important to stress first that there's been a lot of talk about how Trump is anti-expertise and yep. his administration is anti-expertise, but I think it might be more accurate to say that he's drawn on alternative expert networks as, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to rejecting expertise. So, for example, Gorka has a Ph.D., right, even though it's a Ph.D. from not a particularly august institution, as far as I can tell, not within the United States, but he does have a Ph.D. And even someone like Bannon is someone who fancies himself an intellectual. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he had H.R. McMaster in uh, and who himself has a Ph.D. in history. And Bolton, of course, is himself a defense intellectual. So I think rather than to say Trump has totally rejected expertise, he's drawn on non-establishment, uh, except with regards to Bolton and McMaster. But in some part, his uh, administration represents a blurring of establishment expertise and the sort of alternative establishment expertise mm -hmm. like Gorka and uh, a Bannon. So there's all of these elements here. So I think what, what's important to see is that what uh, across administrations from the Obama administration, where you got people like Anne Marie Slaughter and Samantha Power and uh, the Trump administration, where you have people like Gorka and Bannon and McMaster and Bolton. And of course, in the George W. Bush administration, you have people like Wolfowitz, Condoleezza Rice, Doug Feith um, and all these other PhDs in the administration. You could see that these academics, these so-called defense intellectuals, have been permeating the U.S. foreign policy establishment, at least since Iraq. And what my book shows is uh, for much longer than that, and that this was actually a conscious effort among in, amongst intellectuals to become part of the foreign policy establishment. Um, and what my book really shows is that this impulse to become part of this establishment began in the 1930s and 1940s and was actually a response to this um, – What's, what's pretty interesting, a left-wing response to uh, a skepticism about ordinary people's ability to make wise political decisions that emerged from people both in Germany, people like Hans Speyer and Kissinger, but also people in the United States observing the fact that many of uh, Germany's workers and ordinary people actually supported Hitler. So this demonstrated to a generation of intellectuals that they couldn't trust people and that in order to save democracy, they ironically need to become they needed to become part of state institutions in which they were allowed to influence foreign policy without the oversight of Congress or the public. And this becomes this anti-democratic goal that they institutionalize in places like the Rand Corporation, which is a focus of my book. And that allows people like Kissinger and Condoleezza Rice, but also uh, Francis Fukuyama, Rose Gottemuller, uh, Bernard Bernie, Alba Wallstetter, and many others to leave academia, enter these para-state uh, institutions like RAND, and eventually move into the government itself. So let's start from the beginning. Who is Hans Speer? And how does this, um, I mean, just, just basically take us through who he was, and then, you know, through that hit those themes you're talking about from the reaction to Hitler's rise in Germany to these political and intellectual developments in the United States? Sure. So uh, Speyer was basically a guy who was born in 1905 in, uh, in Berlin. He came of age during the Weimar Republic, which is the famous German liberal democracy that eventually falls to Hitler in 1933. Uh, and ironically, as a young man in his tw uh, 20s and uh, into his mid and late 20s, he was a an avowed socialist and actually a left wing socialist. And what he argued throughout the Weimar period was that intellectuals like himself needed to educate Germany's workers in order to, uh, to teach them how to navigate the new institutions of Weimar democracy. Right. Germany is a monarchy until 1918. Uh, Germany loses the war and it becomes this new liberal democracy called the Weimar Republic. And Germany's people who are first enfranchised in the Weimar Constitution, at least fire worries, they don't have the skills necessary to really navigate these institutions, large trade unions, uh, you know, a newly empowered Reichstag, et cetera, et cetera. So what he wants to do is he wants to use his intellectual skills in order to teach workers to manipulate the levers of power directly in this new democratic government. Uh, but what happens to Speyer, and, and indeed many people in his generation, on not only the right, but also the left, and, and the tr true blue socialist and communist left, is that over the course of the late 20s and early 1930s, they become very disenfranchised with Germany's workers, because at least as they see it, Workers supported anti-democratic political movements. On the right, they supported the Nazis, and on the left, they supported the communists, because the communists, like the Nazis in Weimar, 
didn't didn't like democracy. They wanted to, to establish a dictatorship of the proletariat uh, and then let in disguise, et cetera, et cetera. So what what this convinces Speyer, uh, especially after Hitler comes to power in 1933, uh, this convinces Speyer that you're not actually able to rely on ordinary people to defend democracy, which is, of course, what at least his understanding of Marxist theory predicted. Marx said that as uh, societies, or at least as people interpreted Marx in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, people like Bernstein said that as societies become more democratic, workers would support socialists, uh, the socialist movement, and this turned out not to be the case. Mm -hmm. And so what this convinced people like Speyer was that during a moment of crisis in which democracy faced an existential threat like the Nazis, uh, intellectuals couldn't actually rely on ordinary people, but instead had to join state institutions and create the policies that would save democracy for the future. So they, w the way I put it in my book is that they wanted to save democracy from the people for the people. And, and this is what they did. And is there also a parallel lane of, because I'm, you know, I'm then, you know, these people start emigrating to the United States, but I'm also thinking of people like Walter Lippmann, people in American right. context who are also writing, and you, you talk about him as well, who are also setting up the parameters and the frameworks, presumably, and correct me if I'm wrong, they're, they're upset, uh, you know, about sort of some of the public rejection of Wilson's attempts to sort of formalize international institutions. And there is this reaction to, well, you know, particularly when it comes to foreign policy, we just can't have ordinary people influencing it. Now, you know, in that context, it, there's, you know, very little attention paid to the fact that maybe ordinary people were <laughs> quite upset about the totally, un, you know, World War One and the catastrophe and incredible body count, which they had to pay the price for, which is obviously another, you know, theme that runs parallel to this. But what I'm saying is, it, are they able to, they're able, they have this trauma, and then they are able to come here and glom on right. to a tradition in America that's already these sort of like, technocratic mediators of democracy. So maybe like, you know, people with interest in public opinion polling and, you know, how to manage the populace. They can have influence, but it needs to be in tight parameters. Right. I, and I think that's exactly right. So on both sides of the Atlantic, in the United States and Germany, intellectuals are dealing with the new technologies of modernity. Things like mass communication technologies like the radio, you're able to easily print newspapers. And it's ironic in this age of Twitter, uh, people today worry about everyone having a voice. This is exactly what the guys like Spire were saying in the 20s, yep. that to print news magazine, it was so cheap that anyone could have a voice and and this actually um, hurt political discourse. But what happens is in the United States, uh, this journalist and intellectual Walter Littman writes this book called Public Opinion, uh, and uh, these two books, Public Opinion and The Phantom Public, in which he argues that uh, the fact that British propaganda was so uh, able to easily manipulate uh, ordinary Americans into supporting the United States entry into World War I demonstrated that people were easily manipulated and that what you needed to do is you had to re uh, reframe traditional democratic theory, which argued that every American citizen would be able to know enough about public affairs to guide foreign policy in a modern age, because modernity was simply too complex for the average person to understand. Uh, and this was demonstrated by the fact that they were manipulated during World War One. So one, modernity was too complex and two, people were easily manipulated. So what Littman argued is that you needed intellectuals to join. He called it something along the lines of an, in, uh, an organization connected to the state that would be able to make the facts known upon which policy depends to those who have to make the decisions or something along his lines. So Littman basically advocated creating a think tank in the early 1920s, well before the first modern think tanks uh, were created in the 50s. Um, and so what you have is when the exiles come to the United States in 1933 and, and beyond after Hitler comes to power is that they're able to enter into an American conversation that was already skeptical of democracy. But why the exiles are particularly important is because they serve as literal physical embodiments yeah. of what happens when ordinary people are allowed to run rampant in a democracy, right? They're, they're, uh, over time, they're at the most elite American institutions. They get recruited into World War II organizations like the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA, 
or the Office of War Information because the United States needs experts on Germany. So they become a very powerful symbol to Americans about what happens when you get when you let ordinary people really take the reins of government. So this is what they do and why they're so important is because they give a physical presence to Lippmann's claims. Right. They're mm-hmm. totally navigating these institutions in the United States. And you're hearing German. Literally, literally you hear German accents in all of these powerful American institutions. Uh, and so it convinces Americans that they really can't allow this trauma to re- the, the trauma of Weimar to repeat itself in the United States. And I think one of the most powerful examples of the fact that these exiles had such a resonance in the United States is the fact that Kissinger even though he came here as a pretty young uh, child, never lost his German accent, right? And the famous line is uh, Kissinger never lost his accent because he never actually stopped long enough to listen to anyone. But the real reason is that he, um, he, he recognized that it was a way to get cultural currency in the American foreign yeah, policy branding. establishment. Yeah, yeah totally. exactly. It's total, it's total branding. And he still sounds like he just came out of Germany, even though he's been here for the overwhelming majority of his life. And so this is what the exiles are really able to do. Right. He should sound like an old guy on the Upper West Side by now, not like he's, you know, <laughs> like kind of like right. ushering you into a concert in Vienna or something in 1925. <laughs> yeah, um, 19, exactly. So, <laughs> okay, so so that's perfect. And that takes us up to, you know, the the 40s. And, and even, I guess, if, if my reading of this, I mean, obviously, you could see all of the, the landmines and the problems and, that are in place in this, and as well as the ones that I love that are, you know, that are being repeated now. I mean, the fake news conversation. Yes, is fake news and propaganda, corporate and governmental, a major problem? Of course, uh, the solutions that are, you know, the technocratic solutions that are emerging from places like Facebook actually are very jeopardizing of also what could be, you know, very important and legitimate investigative journalism, right? I mean, if you're just, so these themes are all alive. But getting back to our story, we, okay, so World War II is happening. People like Speer are moving inside the defense establishment, inside really the emerging, an emerging defense establishment and the, um, right. you know, intellectual uh, culture of America. Then, after World War II, this is going to start to get formalized. And and later, I, I mean, I have some actually some maybe some more sort of broader contextual questions of how these people fit in and maybe some broader material causes. But in terms of just the story, is this when Rand arises? Like what what the creation of the Rand Corporation? And is this the the same interest in creating institutions outside of a democratic process and a fascination with connecting any sort of latest trend and whether it's, you know, cybernetics or game theory, um, Mm -hmm. you know, to give a scientific uh, veneer uh, to, to these processes. And then I'm assuming, you know, of course this then leads into Vietnam and linear body counts and Ford motor company modeling and McNamara and all of that. Right. And I think that's exactly right. So what's really important to emphasize is that when people like Speyer are arguing for this anti-democratic program in the 30s, where you just need to ignore public opinion and enter the state, is they're saying that this only needs to happen during what they call uh, a moment of crisis, right? Democracy is facing this existential threat with the Nazis. And when you defeat the Nazis, um, basically democratic life could return to normal, or at least this is what people like Speyer were were arguing or implying in the 1930s. Uh, Nevertheless, what happens after the war, of course, is that the Soviet Union gets uh, one far more powerful due to the war. They become a true challenger to the United States on one hand, and on the other hand, in 1949, they get nuclear weapons. And so what this uh, means is that for Speyer, the crisis that had defined the 1930s, which was what he considered a moment of crisis, transforms into an era of crisis. So you can no longer just have ad hoc associations like there's a war and then uh, you're recruited into the government and then you go back into academia. But with the rise of a nuclear armed Soviet Union, that is with the rise of a permanent existential challenge, you now need uh, permanent or institutional solutions to the problem of public opinion that Speyer and Lippmann had identified earlier, right? And so what you're looking for are these institutions like RAND that enable intellectuals to make foreign policy totally outside 
the public's and Congress's purview. So that's where Speyer comes at it. But on the other hand, during World War II, uh, you have all these intellectuals like Speyer and more importantly, probably scientists, physicists, etc., entering into the wartime government. And a bunch of military officials around 1944 and 1945, particularly in the Army Air Forces, uh, the Air Force wasn't an independent unit yet, it was still, uh, sorry, independent branch of the military as part of the, uh, the Army. What you have is that after uh, in 1944 and 1945, they're worried that all of these eggheads are essentially going to return to academia, and they want to maintain their services because they're similarly anxious about the rise of the Soviet Union as mm. a threat to the United States. They want to build world leadership. So what you ha- uh, so they want to build these institutions, but they also don't think that intellectuals are going to want to stay in the military, right? Because who would want to stay in the military voluntarily? Mm-hmm. Uh, so what they do is they, uh, the, this guy, General Henry Hap Arnold, who was parodied on The Simpsons as uh, General Henry Hap Hapablap, if anyone remembers uh, that episode. So, but this guy, General Henry uh, 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 Arnold, basically gives $10 million private corporation, uh, the Douglas Aircraft Company, uh, and Arnold and Donald Douglas, the head of Douglas Aircraft, are actually in-laws. So you see this total embeddedness of the U.S. elite at this moment. But what Arnold does is he gives $10 million to Douglas to found a private research organization, uh, which they dubbed the RAND Corporation, which is an acronym for research and development, in which uh, ostensibly private employees working, pri- uh, I would even say early on solely on government contracts, would be able to offer advice uh, to the military and the government without being subject to any congressional or public sanction, right? So from the very beginning, you have the expansion of the U.S. state. You essentially have the outsourcing of foreign policy research for the U.S. state to, semi, uh, to pseudo-state institutions like RAND where intellectuals are able to offer advice totally without paying attention at all to public opinion. So what this does is that it essentially institutionalizes the anti-public or anti-democratic program that Speyer and Littman had advocated for decades in think tanks like RAND. So these think tanks then become permanently mobilized to fight the Cold War. And of course, unlike in the 30s, the Cold War is from its very beginning set to be a decades-long conflict. You have one uh, by 1949, both powers have nuclear weapons, no one wants to fight a nuclear war, Uh, also no one wants to fight a third world war, and over time you have the emergence of a relatively stable bipolar system. So what happens is this, what is a moment of crisis in the 30s, right, once the Nazis are defeated, democratic life could return to normal after the war becomes an era of crisis in which these anti-democratic uh, ideologies are institutionalized, not only in places like RAND, but in places like the CIA, uh, the National Security Council, which is essentially a body meant to uh, manage America's world hegemony and which is totally outside the Congress's or the public's purview, right? It's only through the National Security Council, for example, that Kissinger gets into power, yep. and recently Bolton gets into power. These are, these are institutions that are not subject to public accountability. So what you see in the late 40s in the foreign policy-making sphere of, American, of the American establishment is the institutionalization of an anti-democratic ethos. And in fact, sorry, yes. No, no, finish on. your thoughts. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna. I was just gonna say uh, you could. Uh, you could even see that this. This lib- what I would call a liberal. Because Spire and all these guys fancied themselves liberals. They were very much not on the right wing. Spire only voted for Democratic Party candidates the entirety of his life. Um, what you see is this. This becomes a part of liberal discourse when you really can't trust people, and uh, you see it still after the Trump election, yep. right? Everyone, right. you know, quote unquote, what's the matter with Kansas? And uh, that famous New Yorker cartoon that was going around with a guy standing up in a plane saying, let me fly the plane. And, of course, every liberal reading The New Yorker was laughing at that. Uh, But what it really showed is that there's still this embedded distrust of the public that emerges from this moment pre-1945, this this traumatic experience with fascism that still resonates in the American imagination, as you can see through the constant use of Hitler analogies. Absolutely. So that, let, let me kind of introduce a couple of other variables into this that I that are not, um, you know, they're they're not comp- contradictory. They're supplemental, and you allude to them. So it seems like a couple of other things. I mean, one thing that's also going on that I think we can, you know, that I'm also interested in for you to touch on moving forward is that I feel like now, you know, in the creation of this system, 
the role of the private sector was subordinate in some ways to you know to to a governmental parastate foreign policy and obviously mm-hmm. those two things were very connected there was always the i mean it's a it, this shouldn't be a cliche eisenhower did warn about a military industrial complex <laughs> in the 50s and it's a very literally a real thing um that's actually one of the sort of more concrete things in american political discourse and political life uh it, you can see it um in in budgets and in foreign policy um but you know moving forward i'm i'm interested in how as the role of the private sector got more and more powerful so that we can even you know tell this story of Iraq, I mean, it's, you know, it's two catastrophes and horror. It's, it's this, you know, invasion, which was totally wrong. And, but then it's also a story of privatization and contracts. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm, so I'm very interested, and you could see these defense intellectuals, at least as it became, uh, you know, more fully conservative. Um, but I would say you could still include democratic, uh, you know, foreign policy thinkers in that as well, that the parallel ran, with a broader sort of marketization and neoliberalization, and you saw it applied to foreign policy, and that applies to everything from you know privatizing Iraq's uh, uh, you know uh, electrical grid to Blackwater, and then the other thing, and and you could just take these. I just want to put these ladies out for you because I like how you know you put them both together. It also seems to me that the other thing that's happening in the forties and fifties and sixties is that. The United States is, has to manage a paradox, and I, and a lot of you know scholars have noted this, but they have to manage that. Okay, first of all, Britain is winding down, and U.S. and the United States is going to take over that sort of U.S. empire role, but it's going to be different. It's not going to be a traditionally colonial one in the way that Britain is. Right? It's going to be colonial through and through bases and through commercial arrangements and through you know keeping the lanes of commerce clean and clear but it's not going to be through the official you know the sun never sets on the british empire right i mean you could argue that it doesn't Mm -hmm. set on the american one either but it's not it's different it's an evolution of that model and then there's the paradox that as that model's evolving it's like okay well on one hand, there's even this rhetoric of, you know, we're a democracy and we're, and we're supporting decolon- decolonization. But then at the same time, we need to make sure that there is no policies that are contradictory to our, you know, <laughs> commercial interests in our lo- zones of influence. And oh, and by the way, you know, we're going to develop this power state apparatus that will, you know, instigate coups, overthrow democracies, organize death squads everywhere from Indonesia to Guatemala as part of the basic mm-hmm. power play. So is that is it also and I guess we can move to the privatization later. I should have brought that up later. But is the is is this also another thing that's going on that you need this sort of grid of thinkers that can not only keep foreign policy out of the public but also start to justify the contradictions because in some senses these other colonial enterprises are much more, you know, they might be hypocritical, but they're coherent, right? Like, you know, the Soviet Union, we're going to put the Red Army in and stamp down the rebellion. And that's what the party Mm -hmm. says. And that is what it is, right? And then in the United States, Mm -hmm. it's like, well, on one hand, we're going to have the United Nations and blah, 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 blah. And on the other hand, oh, whoa, Jacob Arbenz is going to hurt United Fruit. You're gone. (laughs) And you need to create that, you know, so it seems to me that, that there's also the intellectual function that's needed for that. And that's, you know, Kissinger, obviously, I mean, that's theories, balances of power. Um, all of these nations and people and, and principles are totally subservient to an abstracted chessboard um, that he saw the world through and people in that lineage, if that makes sense. Uh, no, that makes absolute sense. I'll take the last uh, part first and then okay. go back. Yeah, to the sorry. Beginning. In any um, way, I gave you a lot. <laughs> no, no, no worries. It's yeah. great stuff. Um, and I think I think you're absolutely right. So it's also at this time it's important to point out that the idea of national security between the 30s and the 50s becomes an actual thing. Uh, and national security, much like the economy and his idea, becomes uh, becomes a thing because it, it becomes an object of social scientific analysis mm-hmm. because it's something that you're able to manage, right? And this is why I see uh, the creation of these sorts of institutions that many on the left 
uh, today critique. It actually uh, emerges from a, uh, the early progressive project, capital P progressive in the 19th and 20th centuries, which was to use experts to manage both political economy in the United States and eventually world affairs in the 1920s and beyond as the United States becomes more involved. So you have um, the creation of this object of analysis that intellectuals like Speyer, intellectuals like Kissinger are able to analyze. Um, so what's interesting here is that you can see how these progressive projects, which is to manage things for the public good, become instantiated in anti-democratic ways due to, the, due to the peculiar experiences of the first half of the 20th century. So Speyer wasn't an idiot. He understood that it wasn't democratic to, for example, overthrow Mossadegh in Iran in 53 or overthrow Arbenz in 54. But he argued that in this moment of crisis, hmm. remember the Cold War is in, in, imagined as a permanent crisis, that actions that were previously considered considered extraordinary were able to be undertaken. So intellectuals like Speyer, through arguments like that, are able to provide intellectual sucker to what I term in the book an ideology of intervention, and the idea that the United States is able to intervene ab abroad when, uh, when, where, and how it sees fit, because it had demonstrated in World War II that it was the only hope for democracy to survive going forward. So what you have here is this uh, total imbrication of progressive politics and what we would consider an anti-democratic or conservative foreign policy, which is a peculiar thing that happens in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and with regards to the first question about the military industrial complex and everything else, what people forget about Eisenhower's farewell address in which he talked about the military and industrial complex, that was only the first warning. The second warning was what Eisenhower termed, uh, he was worried about what he termed the scientific technological elite. So at the very beginning, Eisenhower links the military industrial complex to the scientific technological elite of which Spire is a part because they reinforce each other. So the weapons that are being built by the military industrial complex are justified by the intellectuals like Spire, who argue that the United States needs to have all the power it, 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 uh, possible in order to defeat the Soviet Union, which they perceive as an existential threat to democracy. And it's important to emphasize here that uh, it's really the trauma of the 1920s and the 1930s that leads people to embrace this perspective. It's hard for us to consider today how traumatic Nazism was to a yeah. generation of intellectuals, uh, especially a generation of Jewish intellectuals, because, of course, it's only in the late 40s that Jews are really able to enter the previously WASP foreign policy establishment. And so for these people, um, the, the, the World War II and the Holocaust are really influential. It's not surprising that so many foreign policy intellectuals, all the greatest ones, Albert Wallstetter, Kissinger, Walt Rostow, uh, Schlesinger, uh, Bernard Brody, all of these guys are Jewish because it was in the 20s and the 30s when they were coming of intellectual age and they saw their people almost exterminated by the Nazis, a Nazi threat that the United yeah. States might not have confronted, uh, um, that they become really worried about not only democracy's survival, but the survival of their people. So there's a, there's a reason. These guys weren't just evil, I want to stress, which is what a lot of the literature had treated them as, but they had this really important trauma, which helps lead them, uh, which helps, uh, which helps lead them to this particular political position. And just to get to your final point about sort of the privatization of all these things, uh, the way I would see it is that they're singing the same song, the same anti-democratic song, but they're singing a different tune. So you have in the 50s and the 60s during the sort of New Deal stage of the American state, uh, the outsourcing of a lot of governmental functions to pseudo state institutions like RAND, where they're kind of they're, they're nominally private, but they work solely on government contracts and they're they're subject to some sort of governmental responsibility. But over time, as neoliberalism becomes much more of the ideology from the uh, 1970s forward, you have the anti-democratic ethos um, transferred from pseudo-state institutions like RAND to totally private corporations like uh, Blackwater and things along those lines. So again, this is outside the public's and Congress's purview. So the anti-democratic song is the same, even though the tune of pseudo-state versus totally private institutions is slightly different. So you could see, as, as I see, and I think a lot of people are, are showing um, from 1945 onward, is that there's been a general anti-democratic trend in uh, a lot of areas American, uh, in American life. So people have focused on very much with mass incarceration or the yep. denial of voting rights, the recent gutting of the Voting Rights Act. And what I show is that this was also true 
in the uh, in the foreign policy making process in which the public currently has almost no say. I mean, you could see after all the protests for the Iraq war uh, where nothing happened and no one listened to it. It's just the public is not considered to be a crucial stakeholder, ironically, because they're the ones who are fighting and paying for the wars in American foreign policies. So what I think is a lot of scholars are showing that since 45, America has become progressively and progressively less democratic in certain significant ways. Of course, this doesn't always hold true. For example, the civil rights movement was critical to getting procedural rights, you know, the right to vote to uh, previously oppressed populations who are, of course, still oppressed. But in a lot of areas, um, um, what it means to be a Democrat in America changes from a substantive ideology where people have social, economic, cultural equality to a procedural equality that once people have the right to vote, their democratic responsibility is done, and now you let the experts rule. Right, absolutely. So then that sort of leads, I mean, I, I, as we sort of you know, move towards sort of summing this conversation up, but it, 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 then, and I, and I think that this is, I like it because this is another area where there's just so many parallels to, to draw across so many areas. And of course I've revealed maybe my, you know, the political biases that I have are, you know, zero surprise to anybody watching this show. But I think that, right. So that, that Trump, I mean, his election, that experience was this major shock wave against a certain type of technocratic expertise and a certain type of expectation about how the world works that um, elite people on both sides of, uh, you know, that sort of brand signifier have. And not to say, I mean, of course, people know I certainly thought it was, you know, it was Hillary Clinton was the right and necessary vote in that scenario, but broader and structurally. Same here. Yeah, right. I mean, so we can, you know, hold all of these thoughts at once. But that being said, uh, and and then there's this backlash that we talked about in the beginning. And it's funny because, you know, to me, the appropriate backlash is everything from, you know, the just sort of rank immorality of the whole enterprise to the to the incorrectness of the policies pursued by Republicans to and 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 the baselines are really a, a fundamental disagreement about how the world should work. Uh, it isn't, mm-hmm. you know, it's not a math problem. I think everybody should have mm-hmm, health care, exactly. and I think the United States should not be, uh, you know, killing civilians in Afghanistan or Somalia. Um, and that isn't a procedural argument. That's a baseline right, argument. It, and it's a question of values. It's a question of values, and that is the fundamental anchoring. And 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 exactly. it's, and so, and and so much of the response, and I think we also got conditioned, particularly if we're in our, you know, if we came of age during the Bush era. And that was the game was, you know, Bush lies or some Republican says something dumb. Mm-hmm. Then John Stewart throws to Ugh. the like objective source that debunks the stupid Ugh. lie. And then you make a face and then everybody laughs. Ugh. But that's yeah. over. I mean, it's both over and both it's both over and it doesn't get the job done. So, right. but at the same time, you know, I don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. It is, it's like, well, no, I, I, I want Daniel uh, Bess, uh, Bessner like, I would prefer you as a foreign policy advisor to Sebastian Gorka, first and foremost because of our (laughs) values, but also because I do think that sort of knowing what you're talking about is relevant and, you know, being able... So I guess what I'm saying is how do we capture that balance between basically the crude populist backlash, which is, I agree, it's not actually embodied by Trump, but it's tapped into by Trump and Alex Jones and all the other hucksters of Mm -hmm. our age and salespeople and so on. But then at the same time, uh, not fall back into this other lineage, which might have started with some very understandable you know, horrific trauma and noble motives. I have to give one dispute on that list. I'm going to maintain, I think Kissinger is evil, but maybe that's a conversation for another time, but certainly not these other guys. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and, and there's well, Kissinger a, was also younger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Kissinger was well, I, well, I yeah. think, I think there's a, there's a real depreciating return on the speci- you know, it's like when you talk about Israel, like, Right. The, like, okay, what you did in the 40s is I'm going to look at a very different <laughs> lens than 2018. But all of that being said, yeah. um, you know, how do we strike that balance between honoring uh, the role of social science and expertise, but also 
renewing democracy and making the critique really be one of values and not procedure? I think that's a great question. And just briefly on yeah, Kissinger, he's kind of an outlier here. He was a bit younger and yeah. all of these different things. So he's not quite included in the Speyer group, yes. just to make that very uh, clear. But I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it leads to the uh, the general you know takeaway of the book, which is that when Speyer and all these other intellectuals were uniting with the military and government to create these institutions in the middle of the 20th century, they never once considered the notion of expert accountability. Uh, they either assumed that the experts would police themselves or that the government would naturally police experts if they gave bad advice. But the problem is that this didn't turn out to actually be the case. Uh, so you have experts, they're terrible in Vietnam. They, 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 they lead to this disastrous war, which has leads to the death and destructions of millions of, uh, millions of Vietnamese and their lives. And of course, uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans are negatively affected by the war and it doesn't really do anything. But uh, even though there's this very brief blacklash to Vietnam by the mid 1970s, you know, the experts are back in power. Uh, they're still guiding Reagan's foreign policy and Carter's foreign policy and Clinton's foreign policy. And they're the ones people like Wolfowitz again, help lead to the Iraq war. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to establish a, a system or at the very least a culture of accountability so that when someone like Wolfowitz, when they contribute to the Iraq war, they're not just able to leave the government to become president of the World Bank. And then when they resign from the World Bank, they're not just able, under disgrace. I believe he, he slept with his secretary or something along those something lines. Like so when that, they yeah. resign from yeah, when they resign from the World Bank, they then just can't go to a sin cure at the AEI. And when Jeb Bush runs for president, Wolfowitz can't go to his foreign policy team. There needs to be some sort of accountability in this culture when experts contribute to absolutely horrible policy decisions. And if you don't have that accountability, then people, of course, are going to distrust the experts because they should distrust the experts because they gave us Iraq and Afghanistan. And then uh, and then the other experts on the Democratic side gave us Libya. Yep. So uh, and 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 a, a number of other ones that I can mention. So I think you need some sort of expert accountability. I mean, you see it today when Reince Priebus was just given a visiting assistant professorship at Harvard. Right. You know, at least when Walt Rothstau, uh, who was the national security advisor under LBJ and had some very horrible decisions in the Vietnam <laughs> more, at least when he left government service, he couldn't get a job at MIT or Harvard. He had to go to the University of Texas at Austin, which is a great institution, but it's not where uh, Rostow necessarily wanted to be. So I think you right. need to have these people not being rewarded for contributing to horrible decisions. And the, the elite itself has to take uh, that responsibility unto itself to ensure some accountability, because without accountability, expertise becomes degraded. Uh, people don't trust it because they are right not to trust it. And then you can't bring knowledge to bear on foreign policy. And I do believe that thinking long and hard about something, is, it, it should be valuable, right? right. Uh, now, with something like foreign policy, it's not a science. There's a lot of art, but still, I, I, I guess I, I reveal my cards here. I do think it's worthwhile to have people who have thought long and hard about the subject in positions of power that are able to hopefully provide some good advice. And if they don't provide good advice, then they shouldn't be allowed to provide advice in the future. And I think that is what is completely lacking in our political culture right now. In essence, we need to be more democratic, not less democratic. People like Speyer wanted to, wanted to answer the gamble of democracy by essentially removing that gamble, by saying that the public shouldn't have much influence. I think what we need to do is uh, contribute, if we on the left agree with this, I think we, uh, or like think experts should be a thing. I think we need to contribute to a political education, this very broad idea of helping people understand the world in which we live from the perspective that we see it, uh, and which will also in the, uh, in the end give some more faith to experts who are actually responding to the public's idea and public opinion. So maybe also just a little bit of Japanese values as well. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> where, yeah, where, total, is where is the yeah. shame? Where is the shame? Daniel Vesner, it's, the book is Democracy in Exile, Hans Spear, and the Rise of the Defense Intellectual. It's a fascinating book, and uh, I really appreciate your time. I look forward to more conversations. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. We are going to head to the fun half, 646-257-3920, justcoffee.coop. What is it? I don't have it in front of me. It's some massive amount off of, uh, it's an incredible deal. 30%, 30 off. All Just Coffee products. Um, become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. 
Uh, Patreon.com slash TMBS or Michael Brooks Show on iTunes uh, or Michael Brooks Show on this website on our YouTube channel. Check out Jamie Peck Patreon. Check out Antifada. It's on iTunes now uh, as well. We'll see you all in the fun half. Oops, one second here. Oops. Welcome to Fun Half. We hope you've enjoyed the majority report presented by Smart News. Say goodbye to fake news, nasty trolls, and the filter bubble of your social networks. Get your news in one minute from 300 trusted sources with Smart News. Available for free in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store.